is Mahmoud Amin Gamal. I'm uh, an economist by training. Um, and um, I only got interested in Islamic banking quite recently, actually, um, even though I was aware of American Finance House because I was teaching at Caltech, which is right next door to La Riba. Um, I only was interested in it from a curiosity point of view. I knew Dr. Yahya quite well socially, uh, but I didn't really, and I, I had enough information about the jurisprudence, the Sharia points of view, but I hadn't really studied the issues in depth. Um, uh, then after I left Caltech, I was uh, working at the International Monetary Fund, and there were lots of issues about uh, Jordanian Islamic banks um, opening branches in Palestinian uh, um, uh, areas and so on. And um, so I got to uh, thinking about issues in Islamic banking. And then at Rice University, they had this endowment for a chair in Islamic economics and finance. And when they asked around, they wanted somebody who was a good economist and at the same time was interested in working in this area. So I gave it a lot of thought and then decided that maybe it is an area I want to work in. Um, so I, I got into in, in between while I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin, there was also a conference at, um, at the Central Bank of Kuwait where they were interested in, in uh, monetary policy issues related to Islamic banks. So I wrote a paper about that. So I found that there was um, a sufficiently large body of questions that one can tackle as an economist. And so I got involved in the, um, in the area. I think so. I think that um, th they're not final conclusions because I don't know what is the correct way of thinking about it. So it's easiest when you're thinking about a new topic and maybe that's the, the advantage of having an outsider come in and then study the, this, this literature in, in some detail. Um, the, the first thing you do is you read what others have written and see if it makes sense. And I find that um, a lot of the, uh, of the literature is really driven by its own wish to be convinced of what it's saying. Um, so th there is there's an eagerness to find a quick understanding of what it is that's forbidden, what is riba, uh, what are all the forms that are forbidden, what is the alternative, why is it forbidden this way, and so on. Uh, and so um, people jump to conclusions, in my opinion, that are unwarranted. And actually when one digs deeper in the literature, one finds that um, the earlier jurists from the um, 7th, 8th through 12th, 13th century uh, had entertained those same thoughts but then decided that these were not the correct uh, un understandings or explanations of the nature of riba, why it's forbidden and so on. Now in and of itself this is just a philosophical question because whatever is forbidden we still don't do it whether or not we understand why. So that's, that's a non-issue. However, as we go forward in trying to build a financial system, especially in Islamic countries that are trying to Islamize the entire financial system, um, it is important to think not only what is forbidden in simple transactions that were discussed by jurists, but also to think um, about the economics of what is forbidden, to think what is an Islamic economy, what would it look like, um, how, how to make sure not to fall into the forbidden uh, uh, riba or, or gharar or any of the other uh, forbidden aspects and transactions. So, um, and that leap from um, transactions law that exists in Islamic jurisprudence, which really deals with just bilateral contracts, uh, so, and that's why Islamic finance at the retail level was, was an easier thing to develop because you know that you can't finance a home through a loan with interest because that is riba, everybody agrees. Uh, however, if you do uh, some form of lease to purchase or uh, decreasing uh, partnership between the financial company and the customer, then that is not riba and that is permissible and almost everybody agrees on it except for minute details on exactly how to write the contract, which is okay, there will always be small differences in opinion. So that was easy to develop. But the big questions lie ahead. Uh, because as it exists, it's just a retail service to, to customers. Now, for, for, for the average Muslim, that is a big deal, of course, because most of their investment will be in their home uh, or their retirement account, for that matter, when they're dealing with mutual funds and so on. Uh, so it's, it's a good thing at the personal level, but if we think further about how the, the, the social and the socioeconomic fabric is built, uh, we need a, a, a more solid economic theory. Um, and that's why I, I reached the conclusion that the, the, the opinions that were given on the economic understanding of what it is that's forbidden were, were false um, and, so, and need to be replaced, but I'm not quite sure yet 
um, how one can come up with um, a solid alternative. I have some alternatives that I've suggested, uh, but as with any um, field of human investigation, you keep changing your mind and you keep learning more and you read more things and you adjust your ideas. So it's, it's, I, and I don't think it will ever be uh, definitively answered. The world keeps changing, so it's not 1400 years of a static, identical economy like the one at the time of the Prophet. If we stayed with that economy, we wouldn't even need jurisprudence, because everybody would know from the texts or from the uh, historical record of what the Prophet permitted وسلم, and what he didn't permit. It would be a settled, it would be a settled deal. Uh, the problem is that there are new things that come up. So uh, the, the, um, money, for instance, as we have it now in the 21st century, is only about 150 years old. Uh, it's a phenomenon that did not exist at the time of the Prophet or at the time when jurisprudence was active, because jurisprudence sort of ground to a halt around the 12th, 13th century, when jurists thought that all the interesting questions were already answered and there was no room for any more uh, ishtihad or, or uh, um, diligence in, in, in juristic um, um, studies in order to try to determine uh, how to take the texts of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and apply them to those new uh, circumstances. Then, of course, between that time, the 13th century and the 20th century, the economy changed drastically. And so we have a world now where we're trying to, um, to make a connection with those original texts, which is very difficult. The closest point we have is the understanding of jurists in the 12th or 13th century. It's still a very large gap to fill. And I think jurists were, um, some of them just decided to leave that field completely and not address it. So they, they um, just busied themselves with talking about divorce matters and marriage and so on, which did not change over the last uh, 14 centuries. Those are the exact same institutions, exact same contracts. You know, men and women didn't change, so that's, you don't have to worry about that. But in finance and economics, the world has changed dramatically. Um, one might say that the technological developments in economics are much more fundamental and much more revolutionary than the scientific and engineering discoveries we have. We think that sending somebody to the moon is a big deal. Um, I think developing money as we have it now has enabled economies to do things, including sending people to the moon, that you wouldn't have been able to with the primitive economies of past. It's not only to the Muslims. The concept, of course, exists in the other um, uh, religious texts that Muslims recognize, like the uh, Torah and the, and the Injil. Uh, in the current versions of the Old Testament and the New Testament that people re uh, read, there are multiple references to the prohibition of usury in Leviticus in the Old Testament and, and in many instances in the New Testament. Um, where it's, it's clearly stated that riba is forbidden. As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church had that as part of their, uh, their creed up to the um, 12th, 13th, up to almost the 15th century. They still were applying the laws of usury and, and um, uh, European bankers had to discover tricks for, for getting around that prohibition. And eventually it was dropped and usury, which used to refer to any increase, um, got only to uh, refer to exorbitant um, rates of interest. And as a matter of fact, to this day, many states in this country have usury laws that are ceilings on interest rates, so you cannot charge more than, say, 25% or whatever. So, but that's now the, the, the modern meaning of the term usury. Uh, in, in classical times, usury actually meant any increase uh, in a loan. So, so it's, it's not new to Islam. Of course, Islam also recognizes that the message that was sent to Muhammad is the exact message that was sent to the earlier uh, prophets uh, with different emphasis in different times. In my opinion, the, it's, it's interesting that you use the term the Islamic system because that's a word that's used, that's a phrase that's used a lot. I do not think that can, there can be a single Islamic system. Uh, Islam is a framework. It is not a system. And therefore there are multiple systems that can be developed within Islam. Some of them will be viable, others will not. The systems that they have uh, advocated um, since the mid-20th century I think are not viable. Uh, so um, I, I, um, 
I, I would be uh, very worried about countries trying to, to apply those um, um, poor economic theories of what an ideal Islamic society would look like. I think we need much more research and much more in-depth understanding both of the Sharia and of economics on the part of the jurists before we can reach the point of saying that a particular system is an Islamic system. In the meantime, there are quick fixes. Again, so, so I view the retail Islamic financial industry, again, I say it's, it's a major development for individuals. Uh, men and women living in this country or in other countries where they have financial needs uh, and where the, the dominant force in financial sector is um, lending with interest, which is forbidden, uh, find great satisfaction to have these services provided to them. But that's only a very small part of the financial system. Uh, and uh, the more important uh, financial questions usually refer to governments and financial markets. And uh, those are the issues that we need to tackle. Uh, and they are much, much more difficult to answer at this point. So that's why we need the research. Um, I don't know if, if uh, any quick answers will be, will be satisfactory. And uh, I think jumping to conclusions and following wrong leads can actually set us back rather than help us go forward. So I'm, I'm very happy with, with the movement now to have those retail shops um, that, that provide Islamic financing at the retail level. But I don't think that, um, that this is really what, what we're talking about when we're talking about Islamic finance as an industry. Um, it's just a few hundred million dollars, um, which is a drop in the bucket. I mean, major banks uh, would have a single desk that trades in this in one day. So um, it's, it's hardly an industry. There are many obstacles. Um, some of them are, um, are our own doing and some of them are, are because others are suspicious. Um, um, there are obviously political obstacles because um, anything having the label of Islamic finance will always draw the attention of uh, regulatory agencies uh, because it's an, uh, to them it's an unknown system and um, they like regulations that they've worked on year after year after year has been reviewed by their lawyers and so on. Uh, there is another political dimension in that there are struggles around the world uh, where the West sometimes views itself as an adversary of Muslims and they're worried that funds uh, in anything that is labeled Islamic may be somehow finding their way to uh, groups that are uh, to, to, to whom they are, um, they are uh, opposed. Uh, so that's another, so that's the political side from, from outside. Our own doing is, um, is also that in many Islamic countries, uh, again, uh, Islamic finance is, is very much tied to political Islam, which uh, is, is antagonistic to many of the regimes in the, in the Islamic world. So again, uh, internally we, we, we are worried about, um, about empowering certain groups within those countries. Uh, so th th there are lots of, of, of political uh, obstacles. Uh, the intellectual obstacles are, in my opinion, much more important uh, because in the long term, uh, political issues can be resolved. Um, but um, if, we, if we make um, wrong conceptual um, uh, views, uh, if, if we take wrong conceptual views about what is forbidden, it's very difficult to undo those perceptions. Just like those perceptions that were uh, propagated by Abu al Maududi and Bakr Sadr and so on in the middle 20th century are with us today and most people still think in those terms as if those were not the views of just uh, mujtahids who are not actually even experts in economics in, in, in the, the modern sense of the word, uh, but purely people who read uh, a little bit in jurisprudence, a little bit in economics and thought they could see a parallel and it stuck with us um, and the terminology of that past is, is, is very difficult to, to remove from our dictionary. Um, so I think um, in order to, to have a steady development of a sound Islamic financial system we need to start from ground zero and ground zero is the Quran and the Sunnah. We go back to those texts then we read the writings of the jurists with a view to what parts of what they wrote was an explanation of those texts 
and in that respect, we assume always that they are better than we are because they are closer to the source linguistically, historically, uh, and, and culturally. And what part was their economic reasoning? Because that we can improve upon. And so what I think is the task of, of the academician is to uh, disentangle those two parts, and it's very difficult, from the writings of those jurists. Which part was purely explaining the text and which parts were interpreting the text in, in light of their economic understanding. And then the job would be to form alliances between economists who can replace the, the old sort of um, out-of-date economic thought with state-of-the-art economic thought and then with the help of jurists try to merge it back with the understandings of the Islamic texts, the Quran and the Sunnah, to form a new ishtihad, a new understanding of what those texts are really saying for our time, rather than try to take something out of its time and place and, and plug it into our modern times where it doesn't fit. That's, that's very true, um, and, and for good reason, the writings of those older jurists are much better than the writings of the contemporary jurists. So if you compare texts, it's clear uh, which one you feel more comfortable uh, with. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a do or die task. I mean, either we bring our communities into the current era, um, and I don't think they're stuck 800 years ago, as you were saying. I think um, they have a split uh, view of the world. Uh, many of those people in their actual business dealings will be very modern uh, and very uh, productive um, and may use some of the financial uh, some of the financial products that uh, otherwise they would be condemning and then when they put on their Islamic hat they have a completely different persona. So um, I, I think we have uh, a dichotomous society uh, with some people who are living in the past and some people who just have uh, a fiction from the past but they're actually uh, living in the present uh, with, a, with a split personality. So what we need to do is to uh, merge the two personalities in a sense, bring up jurisprudence up to speed to the 21st century so people can feel uh, comfortable that they are living in this world and at the same time they're using the historic